A student recently wrote to me and asked, the take home message regarding COVID-19 is that we don't have the evidence, we don't have the randomized trials we all wish we had, but doctors need to make decisions now about patient care. I'm very curious about how to be discerning in times of crisis and how to keep that EBM lens even when the specific rules of the evidence pyramid can't be followed. So given the lack of evidence we have about how to control the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, where do we go next? The goal of this module is to outline some ways that we can think about how to approach uh, the evolving evidence and make evidence-based decisions. In this time when we have less than the optimal evidence available to us, we have to make decisions based on the evidence that we do have. Um, we can't always wait until the top of the evidence pyramid evidence arrives. We have to make decisions now. So we have to realize that the evidence is continually changing, like every day, sometimes multiple times a day. We have to make decisions based on indirect evidence, realizing that some of these decisions will be wrong. And we have to realize that there may be better decisions than the ones that we make now, but we won't know until all of this is over. That's pretty uncomfortable. Some sources are more valid than others, and some present more relevant information than others. Medical gossip abounds, with many people suddenly considering themselves to be amateur epidemiologists. Fancy graphics does not mean there is good science behind the graphs. Be discerning in the information you use. Avoid wide-sweeping characterizations of prevalence. Try to find information that applies best to your situation. Decide what you want to know and look for that. More information is not better and we can avoid information overload by not trying to take in everything. It is easy to get toasted by too much information. Models of spread always contain assumptions that may not be accurate. Much information about treatments is preliminary, based on lab or animal research, or is based on few subjects. How these results are interpreted will reflect a framing bias. Some will look at the glass being half full, whereas others will see it as half empty. We have to realize that any intervention, no matter how seemingly small, has the potential for harm as well as the potential for benefit. All the extra hand washing will likely lead to an increase in hand eczema. In other words, the common phrase, you can't be too careful, is wrong. Take a moment to acknowledge the risk to any intervention. Try to identify the possible harms, their magnitude and likelihood, and weigh these estimates against the possible benefits of the intervention. Don't confuse test results with the presence or absence of a disease. Positive tests can be falsely positive, and negative tests can be falsely negative. Learn about the characteristics of the common tests you perform, and those you use rarely, but which have a high clinical impact. Tests with a high specificity are usually pretty good at ruling in the diagnosis, if they're positive. Tests with a high sensitivity are usually pretty good at ruling out the diagnosis if they're negative. Most importantly, if you run a test on someone just in case, so in someone who is very unlikely to have the disease and the result comes back positive, there's usually a good chance it's a false positive. Recognize there is a spectrum of disease with some patients who are truly uh, have the infection will have few symptoms, some will have moderate symptoms, and some will have severe symptoms. This realization is important because only the patients with severe symptoms are on the news and that tends to skew the way we think about things. But we have to realize that there's a complete spectrum because it's important both for understanding our own risk as well as understanding the approach to avoid spreading the pandemic. Cognitive biases rule our decision-making and decision-making of others. There's no such thing as being coldly rational. 
However, not all the cognitive biases are bad. It's just important that we know about them. There's a long list of cognitive biases. The availability bias, the confirmation bias, belief bias, the ostrich effect, the Dunning-Kruger effect, lost aversion bias, action bias, and many others that will color our decisions and the decision of others. So, look up lists of cognitive biases to understand how we usually make cognitive errors. However, I'm not sure there is any logical protection against these biases, especially the emotional ones. For example, look up blind spot bias. Keep some perspective. Broadly speaking, we have three goals in medicine. First, we want to relieve or prevent patient's suffering. Second, we want to maintain or provide hope. Last, we want to prevent, treat, or cure disease. We, science, medicine, politicians, everyone, we don't know the answers. Some people with great confidence will claim that they do. When asked, get used to saying, we don't know. Use we instead of I, since all medicine is not sure. Rather than arguing a particular point, simply point to your information sources and let your dissenter evaluate it. For your own sanity, decide what you can and can't influence. Focus on what you can influence. When friends and family ask, uh, respect their values and preferences. Tell them the best information you have. Change your own mind as new information becomes available or as your own values and preferences change. Last, be kind to yourself and to others.